Thank you for watching my Ordinary Angels podcast. So that more people can be inspired by my wonderful guests, we would love it if you would like, share and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And to say thank you for doing that, we'd like to give you a digital download for free of my book Inspire, Inspirational Reflections for Your Life's Journey. I'm Marilyn Carter, be happy. So welcome to my blog and podcast. Here we are for an Ordinary Angels interview today, 2019 Tamworth Country Music Festival. It's a great time to catch up with loads and loads of artists, lots of people, and I'm starting my interview today with Steve Grace. Hi. I feel very honoured to be called an Ordinary Angel, so thanks for uh, inviting me on the show. Well, it's a bit of an interesting name, isn't it? Because it's kind of Ordinary and Angel. But the thing behind this is that ordinary people can do extraordinary things. And I think you're an extraordinary person because you're an Australian country rock and gospel singer. We first met in about 1991 because you and I were actually on the same record label for a short time, yep. Heartland Records. Now, I've got a little something I prepared earlier because this was me in 1991. How funny. I remember that CD. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because you were actually, my, I look so young. We won't think about how long ago that is, right? But you were my first uh, support tour that I did. And we were on the road for 31 days and we did 28 gigs, I remember. Nearly killed me yep. because uh, we were sort of outback rural Australia. Not as outback as you travel now, which is what we're going to talk mostly about today because I just love that work that you're doing. But we were in some interesting places. Yes. Mm. And uh, we have some funny little anecdotal stories. And in fact, we caught up yesterday because you sang on a uh, country gospel show here at the Capitol Theatre in Tamworth. And I was recalling a story that I'm gonna recall now because uh, the folks need to know what genuine touring is like. And it's not much different today, is it? Because we don't have the big budgets. We don't get in a great big tour bus. You actually just take the camper van, head out there, see what happens. With a PA system and a light show and all your uh, multimedia gear, and, um, which is a bit different to 1991. Which is very different <laughs> to the old days. Yeah. But uh, I think when I got into this, I realised I'm going to be a roadie for the rest of my life. And uh, and if you're not willing to do that, then don't get involved in, yeah. in travelling music. But yeah. there's something about getting out there and singing your songs to people across the country that, mm. um, oh, it's just, uh, to me, it's one of the highest privileges. Well, you've been doing it for how many years now? 33 years on the road doing it full time as a gospel artist. Yes. And I sang in pubs for seven years before that, which kind of scares me. That's 40 years of, of like music in front of people. And I sang in church um, as a teenager uh, a few times and in retirement villages. And that's really where my music career started was singing to old folks after church on a Sunday, right. go down to the retirement village and, and sing some songs and encourage people. And uh, it was an incredible foundation to start with because you realise the power of a song to, to lift people's spirits. It certainly is an amazing medium to touch people's souls, isn't it? I was laughing just in my head then because I'm thinking perhaps in another 30 or 40 years you'll be back in the nursing home singing to the oldies again and you'll be one of them. <laughs> singing to myself. <laughs> Uh, so in the 90s when I started travelling with you it was a real eye opener and I, I didn't know what to expect but you'd been doing it for quite a few years. You just had the big hit album Children of the Western World mm -hmm. and that was the tour where there was a truck on stage, huge big production, lighting guys, sound guys, we did have roadies then. Yes. Um, but it was still tough, I remember, because one particular night, and this is a story we, we revisited yesterday, 
we rolled into a little rural town somewhere we think might have been New South Wales, Queensland, and accommodation was always provided. But sometimes you were, we were billeted a lot in people's yes. homes. So yeah. This particular night, it was a little country town, not much accommodation available. And we didn't have a chance for some reason before the show to go to the e-com, so we're rocking in in the middle of the night, and there was one room for all of us. I was the only girl on the tour for most of it. Yep. So I was like, okay, suck it up. Here we all pile in and this one room. And it was bunk beds. Bunk beds. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was kind of like a dormitory, wasn't yep. it? Some kind of school camp. Yeah. So we go, all right, take a deep breath. Don't be too much of a princess. And uh, I remember I was on the bottom bunk and you happened to be on the top bunk and there was another bunk there and everyone was around. We went to sleep because we were knackered. Yeah. And uh, I woke up in the morning with the light streaming in the window. And as I looked up going, oh my goodness, what are we doing here? All underneath, on the bottom of your mattress, the top of me was like mouldy. Oh, it was so gross, wasn't it? <laughs> and I remember, I remember calling home and going, "Oh man, this is what happened. I don't know if I can keep doing this." Yeah. But every night when you get out on stage and you meet the people and you sing the songs and you see that music does have an impact, that's what keeps you going. And I bet that's just a tiny little story for you because you do so much outback touring and have for all those years yes it's probably where i um, learned to live by the phrase expect mistakes and expect miracles <laughs> right because uh yeah people will um will say yeah we've we've provided accommodation and then when you turn up and it's nothing like what you're expecting uh and you realize that uh, it's not always going to be like you want it to be but if you can overcome that and and, and be real with the audience that has turned up. People have travelled in, in a lot of rural and remote areas. People have travelled a few hundred kilometres just to come to your event. And yes. that uh, that's quite an honour to be able to sing. You've got an hour and a half, two hours to uh, to plant something you know, in people's lives that mm. hopefully will really help them mm. and their families. So. And in some of the really remote areas, you might be the only show touring that year or at least half of, year, half of a year. There's a pioneer that I know that you absolutely love. And in fact, you've recorded in one of your 22 albums, you've recorded a tribute to our very own country music pioneer and icon. And later in the week, I'm actually through Ordinary Angels interview, I'm catching up with Anne Kirkpatrick. Uh, who is, of course, the daughter of Slim Duster, Dusty. And I know that you are a big fan of Slim's, not just because of your tribute album, but because he kind of went before. And at the same time that you were doing these rounds, how did, how did him and his life and his music influence you? Well, I, as a kid, uh, I grew up in Papua New Guinea. And um, Dad loved country music. And back in those days, we had an old national reel-to-reel -reel player and my uncle and aunt would the send up that the old tapes yeah ran around yeah. around yeah. yeah and uh not even a cassette tape just like a big version <laughs> of that and um my uncle would send these tapes up to my dad and my earliest memories were listening to johnny cash um johnny horton and right. slim dusty right and uh and then when we came home to Australia, I would have been about 11 years old and my dad bought quite a bit of Slim's music. And so that, whenever we went on a, a road trip in the old XY Falcon, <laughs> that's what we would listen to. We're not, we're, we're not even getting the Falcons anymore, are we? So no. that's beyond the numbers and the letters, yeah. Yeah, it was back yeah. in the early 70s. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I fell in love with the way that Slim Dusty told stories Mm. And and did that as a, a really as a balladeer and uh, a bush poet, uh, but uh, just the real Australia and and something that I think every one of us long for is mm. getting back to uh, to who we really are, to our true identity as as Australians and um, the way that Slim connected with Indigenous peoples across the country mm -hmm. inspired me, and I thought, man, I'd I'd love to go to some of those places that that Slim went to. And mm -hmm. it really was, it, it was almost, um, he was just a great role model for like, that's how I'd like to live my life. Yes. And you've done that. Yes. it's. Uh, and you take the swag too, don't you? We take swags with us, yeah. And uh, yeah, camp out in the middle of absolutely nowhere, uh, which people pay big money to go and do that these days, but we actually do it as a job. Yeah. Um, 
and yeah, still try and do 100 to 120 towns a year. And um, it, you know, in every state of Australia, that's gotten harder and harder over the years. Uh, the, as the invitations come in, you could end up, you know, spending six months just in one state of Australia. Yes. So uh, yes. look, it's been an incredible journey, and I hope we've got a few more decades to go. Yeah. You actually have lived in the city as much as as you've lived in the country. So it's interesting. Is it a, a bit of a juxtaposition? When you're out in the outback under the stars in a swag, in the dust and the dirt and the heat, to come back and live in suburbia? Yeah, there's two very defined cultures here in Australia. You've got people who are a part of country culture and and, and I probably... As in rural, not country music, yep. Yes, yes. yeah. And I endear myself more to folks that live in... Communities that are still networked by relationship and by local footy clubs and and netball clubs, and uh, just the the social life that takes place in a country town, um, we're slowly losing that in our culture. Yes. And uh, then you've got tribal, um, you know, Aboriginal culture. Mm. Um, that that's probably my favourite places to go to is the the remote tribal communities across Australia. And ironically, uh, my music opened the doors to be able to be invited into hundreds of, of uh, remote communities mm. over the years, and that's probably what I love doing the most these days. Yeah. Um, I come to the big city to uh, to get inspired, but also to realise I don't want to live there anymore. <laughs> Good place to visit. <laughs> yeah. But you want to move on afterwards. Yeah. But there's still a lot of great people who live in the big smoke. Yeah. And, uh, and have some great insights because it can be polar opposites, can't yes, it? Yes, yeah. Yeah. And um, my concerts these days are all visual. It's, it's like taking people to the movies as well as a concert. Yes. And I love taking my outback imagery and uh, imagery of um, uh, Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands and uh, just the, yeah, the, the regions that I am privileged to travel to, yeah. to take imagery of that back to the big city. It really inspires yes. people. And I've had many letters over the years from people just saying, thank you, um, your concert inspired me to literally pack up with the wife and kids and get out there and actually see this great country of ours. Because it's a, a massive but most beautiful country that we live in. And until you're actually out there and not just on the tourist fly in, go to see Ayers Rock, Uluru, fly out again, Yeah. right? You need to go and actually live out back for a little bit. Dave and I get the opportunity to do a week here and a week there in the outback, N nothing like you do, um, probably not into the swag like you are either, but we love the people. And in some ways it feels like the culture of rural is, is maybe 20, 30 years behind what we would see in the city. But in many ways they are still very far ahead because um, they, because of this face-to-faceness, they can't get away with nonsense in yeah. the same way that when we live our community on Facebook. Uh, we were talking to Kim, Tim Costello recently and he was saying that one of the things that he notices when he does a lot of overseas and through World Vision they also do a lot of Aboriginal community work is that when you're living in community like that, you have to build a bridge. Because when we're on IT, we have the people on Facebook who agree with us. And we have our social networks. It's easy if someone doesn't agree, we can just go delete. But when you're out there, you've actually got to build those bridges to build relationships, to repair relationships. Yes. Do you <clears throat> see that as a, is that something that you've identified as being attractive to you? Is that something that you see as vital to the ongoing of humanity? Or can we get away with uh, having a friend in Japan and one in Adelaide and, you know, but not too many right here? I don't know how much longer we can go with, with living in an artificial uh, network of relationships. Mm. Uh, I, I fear for the next generation who live their whole lives on their smartphone mm. and um, the, all of their relationships are, are you know, are connected through what they type into their, their phone or their iPad. Mm. And um, yeah, I'd, uh, even in remote regions, I'm, I'm concerned about that. Uh, just kids getting addicted to um, internet-related um, media and communication. 
um, there's nothing like the face to face, as you say, yeah. and uh, and being real and and working through the the real issues, the real problems, the mm. challenges that we all have in our lives. Yeah. Um, relationships are best restored uh, when it's done, uh, you know, in honesty and. Um, it, it, not with uh, yeah, some form of mm. communication, but just yeah. being together. And, you know, here we are on a live podcast. So yeah. we, we want that IT and you take IT with you. Yeah. Uh, we're not saying that that's bad, but it can't just be that. Yeah. We need to be, be able to go, sorry, mate. Because it's very hard, much harder to hurt someone face to face than it is to type something. Yeah. yeah. I think in each of us, there's this desire to belong and I've, I see that in remote indigenous communities, everyone belongs in that community yes. and issues are sorted out. Uh, I, 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 uh, I fear for uh, you know, many of my brothers and sisters uh, in different tribal communities across Australia for um, they're almost forced to live in two parallel worlds. They have to live by traditional laws but then they also have to live by white man's laws. Yes. And a lot of times they can clash. And it's, it's why uh, many of our prisons in more remote areas are filled with young Aboriginal men who've mm. um, you know, either committed serious crimes or committed the most menial crimes that really, um, you know, something that, that you and I, we get a, get a speeding fine or our car's out of registration, we pay the bill. And um, a lot of young fellas get locked up for, you know, insignificant things like that. Mm. But it's, it's caused a great divide in, uh, in our country. And the one thing that I love about gospel music is it brings people together and it actually helps to glue a lot of the damage that's been done. Um, unfortunately, our governments think that just throwing more money at um, a problem is going to make it go away, but it's mm. not the truth. It's about bringing uh, that, that sense of community and belonging back into every uh, tribal community, every country town. And that comes through helping people build good relationships yes. and, uh, and, and break down the, the curses that are on us. I, I think gambling and addiction mm. are two of the big curses that are on our country at yes. the moment. And uh, to help people overcome addictions, whether it's alcohol or drug addiction, uh, whether it's it's um, you know pornography, whatever is destroying people's lives, mm. the way that they they treat each other. Yes. Um, we've got to be able to help people, you know, yeah. overcome those things. Yeah. Um, and gambling is a big one in our country that I I don't think we actually see the real damage that is done. Um, well, it's often hidden, isn't it? Because it's very shameful. It is, yes, mm. yeah. yeah. And so I love going and putting on a concert, getting an entire community together and, uh, and bringing them back to the message of the gospel and the hope that comes from that. Yes. Um, I think my biggest fans are elderly Aboriginal women yes. who just say, Steve, could you please come and sing some songs in our community? Yes. And uh, one of their favourite songs is a, an old song off an album of mine called One Night in a Million. It's a song called Men of God We Stand. And everywhere I go, the women say, could you please sing that song for all our men? We want them to, to, uh, to stand up. And yes. I've realised as Aussie men, we do need to, to stand up. And um, when I really believe when, when the men stand up for what is right and true, the women and children are safe. Our communities are safe. Mm. If us men lose the plot, I, things start falling apart pretty quickly. Yeah. And, I've, and I've seen that in so mm. many communities. Well, we've, we've disempowered our men in lots of ways in yep. Australia over, over recent decades. I think watching my daughters who are now in their early 30s and their husbands, they have a very different view of relationship and a view of marriage than what perhaps our generation have had. Um, and I think that men of our generation maybe were kind of caught between that, you know, women livers and uh, trying to stand up and be everything for the family. Now we're getting a bit more balanced. And I think that's absolutely vital. I remember, and, I, and I've never told you this, um, but I remember when I was on that tour with you first up, I found the male thing very hard, being the only woman on the tour. And I felt um, a bit indignant when I had to do the lunches. 
because I thought, am I the only woman so I have to do the lunches, right? I now know that that wasn't anything to do with it. That was my uh, perception of things and where I was coming from. I was actually um, heading down the, the path to divorce at the time. So I was a bit anti-men and, and you know, all that was going on in my private life. Yep. But um, it's really interesting now, and, and it's great to hear you say that. Are, do you, are you aware of Franciscan Father Richard Rohr? Yes. Yeah. Wonderful man. And what he does is uh, started about 19 years ago, I think, and he's in multiple, multiple countries now. He is actually uh, has camps as a rite of initiation for young men so that men can go, this is who we are. So that they are feeling empowered to go into their community and with the women, alongside them, not over them, uh, they can help lead the community and have strong families. Yeah. Do mm. you see that kind of thing? Like traditional Aboriginal people had that. It's kind of got lost. It's, yes, gotten very lost. Yeah. The biggest killer of men in Australia between the ages of 16 and 44 is suicide. Yes. And uh, we, we've lost something and we need to get it back. Mm. I truly believe I'm a big fan of country music. Um, Me or, too. Or as Slim Dusty <laughs> called it, people's music. Yes. Because you can uh, have a great influence on people's lives through the kind of songs that you sing yes. and the music that you play. And uh, I, I got into country music, like I told you, you know, when I was young. Dad yeah. used to play a lot of country and... Uh, even as a teenager, I remember liking country music and getting picked on by all my mates because they were all into heavy metal. And um, but I'll I'll be seventy years old in just just on ten years, and uh, I'll still be playing country music. Yes. But all my mates, they won't be listening to heavy metal anymore. No, that's right. They catch up eventually. Yes, but all all that to say is. Um, I'm convinced that music is a wonderful way to help change um, some of the damage that has been done yes. over generations. Because yeah. um, it brings a message of hope and yeah. healing and let's, let's get together and... And it is about emp empowering men, yes. empowering women, yes. uh, empowering families to, to work together, work through their, their relationship problems yes. and, and make the most of this wonderful life we've been given. Mm. It's wonderful on your website, uh, you say that you have a song in your heart for the people of this land. And when I go to your website and have a look at your, your gallery, most of the pictures there are with Indigenous Aboriginal people here in Australia. Uh, I love that because your heart is obviously genuinely there. Do you have something of wisdom to tell those of us who don't have that same opportunity but are very aware of the issues that are going on? in very rural and remote areas of Australia. David and I have visited quite a few Aboriginal communities. I feel when I'm out there that my songs can relate, but I found that often the stories that I tell around our songs, I'm standing there talking about my fridge and putting a magnet with a story on my fridge and I'm, I'm looking around going, hmm, not quite relevant. And then I had another story at the time about our car and, uh, you know, stopping to buy a teddy bear at the shop when we were coming. You know, they're kind of worlds apart from the people who are living and maybe never get into the city areas. You know, do you, I guess you've, you've worked in this environment for a long time, but it, it's challenging, isn't it? Because you need to, when we're working with people, we need to tell the stories that relate to them. Walking in their shoes with them for a while, not just giving our opinion. And I, I don't want to use the word missionary for you, but you kind of grew up in that missionary environment, yes. didn't you? In Papua New Guinea, you were there with the Bible College. Um, was Wy Wycliffe Bible Translators. Yeah, translators, yeah. that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. So was that very different in that environment in Papua New Guinea to what you're doing now? Or did that kind of give you an influence and an idea about what you wanted to do and how to approach that? I think the, the the short answer to that long question... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> is, um, long way around to that. Yeah. Uh, I, I love reading the gospel stories about Jesus as he travelled around uh, what is now Israel. Yes. Uh, uh, with just a, just a bunch of ordinary blokes, some of them pretty rough. <laughs> and yet how he prioritised the the little people and the ordinary people and and there's recorded evidence of in the the gospels of these wonderful stories of how suddenly some unknown person with a sickness became the most important person to Jesus although he was 
surrounded by multitudes of people. My, and the religious guys too, who all wanted Peter all, his time. All wanting to take him out. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but my mum and my dad, uh, they spent 10 years in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. And my memories of, of, of seeing the way my mum and dad dealt with people and helped people. Um, an Aussie missionary uh, from Africa many years ago wrote a book called Three Cups of Tea. And the one thing I have learned is that people will not respect the message that you've got until you've been back to where they live th three times and sat down and had three a cup of tea with them. Right. There's something about oh, going that's back. fantastic. Yeah. It's not about yeah. going to an Aboriginal community once and saying we've done it. It's about going back three times. And, it, and, and during that process, real relationship, yeah. real friendship. Perhaps being quiet. Yeah. Just listening. Yeah. Uh, the authenticity of that is yeah. what I have pursued in mm. in my life. I, if you know, people say, how have you been able to, to do music for over 30 years? Yeah. And I think it's, it's really about being real with people. People, especially Aussies, I reckon they can smell BS a mile off. Yeah. And, uh, if, and call it. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Thankfully. If you can show that you actually, you do care about people and you do want to come back. It, now, it's not always possible to go back uh, to every place that you've been to. Yes. But um, it's such a joy when you do go back and you see the fruit of the last time that you were there. Yes. And I think that's what has driven me as a, yeah. an Aussie singer-songwriter, yeah. gospel artist over the years. I love that too. I feel like I've got a friend in almost every country town. Yeah. Um, and I love that. And I love that you catch up with people all around Australia. Sometimes I go, where do I know you from? You know, what town do you live in? Because I'm seeing them here or at another festival. We've done the festival round very much over the years, probably a little more than what you've done. You've had your own rounds that yes. you've done. But it is, it is that camaraderie, isn't it? And catching up and, and feeling like that. Yeah, together we can actually make a difference because we're going back to these places and going, what's going on and, and how can I help? So let's talk about that because uh, you love trucks and bikes and dirt. And uh, you had an adventure on motorbikes some time back. Tell us a little bit about that. Because when I came to one of your shows last year, it wasn't a truck on stage. It was a... A so, motorbike, a Harley yeah. Davidson. Was it a Harley? Yes, yeah, yeah. see, I know nothing about <laughs> motorbikes, although I have been on a Harley. But, okay, tell us about the Harley. The Harley Davidson that you saw was uh, the Crossing Australia Harley, uh, the first Harley Davidson to ever cross Australia from west to east via the Great Deserts. And That and particular bike? Yes, yeah. Oh, we'll see if we can get a picture of that oh, to, to show. I can give you a picture Great. of it. Uh, and you were on that? I rode that thing the entire time. Seven thousand kilometres. Over how long? It took twenty-eight days. Uh, but the real reason for doing the ride, uh, I've always wanted to ride a, a Harley across Australia because no one's ever done it. Um, plenty of blokes are you, ride. Are you in the Guinness for that World Book of Records? Not, I don't know. I haven't checked it out. But um, plenty of we blokes. Might check that. That would be interesting. Because plenty of blokes ride KTM's and BMW dual sport bikes across the Great Deserts every oh, okay. every year. Right. But no one had ever done it on a Harley, and I thought, oh. man, I'm going to have a go at it. Okay. So, uh, but the real reason for doing it was um, for depression and suicide prevention in remote communities. Yes. My second son Ryan went through a really tough time about seven years ago, and and nearly took his life. Or attempted to take his life. Right. Uh, just got mixed up with the wrong crowd, um, got addicted to drugs and alcohol, and, uh, yeah, just started self-destructing. Yeah, broke his own heart as well as yours. Yeah, and miraculously, and we're very thankful that, uh, that he's still with us mm. and now is a, a head mentor uh, with a drug and alcohol um, organisation in Victoria, uh, just helping men recover Let's from... Let's give that a plug. Yeah, Teen Challenge. Teen Challenge, you're right. And, uh, so Ryan works up in Kyabram in country Victoria on yes. an 85-acre farm and they, they take in up to 30 uh, young men and some older men um, that uh, simply need some time away from their environment to uh, not only dry out and 
and uh, detox, but really to get their lives back on track. And Teen mm. Challenge does an incredible job at helping to rehabilitate um, yeah, men and women who are, uh, who are just at the end of themselves in life. And we can yes, all get to that absolutely. place. Absolutely. Yep. So Ryan um, yeah, has got an incredible story to tell. I'm very proud of him. And we decided let's do a, a, a big um, trip across Australia um, and visit remote communities. Uh, tragically, the suicide rate in Indigenous communities in Australia, uh, even now, is... Um, it, it, it's it's terrible to look at the mm. statistics on it. But at the time of filming this, which is end of January 2019, five Aboriginal women committed suicide in custody just last week here yeah. in Australia. Yeah. Terrible. And that breaks my heart. Yeah. And uh, we've got to we've got to keep. It's complex, right? It's not. There's no easy solution. There's no easy solution to it. But the one thing that we can all be doing, uh, anyone, anyone watching and listening. Yeah. I always encourage local churches, local schools, community groups, make a connection with a remote community and go and have three cups of tea. Yes, and that is actually easier to do than you'd think. Yeah. Because there are organisations out there that can connect you. Yeah. And, and you don't have to go out there and troubadour on your own. You go out and you're with a group of people. I had a letter from a lady called Anita Bailey up in Amblutterwatch. I won't try and spell that, um, but Amblutterwatch is a remote community in, in the Sandover region, which is between, on a map, if you look between Mount Isa and Alice Springs. Right. A, I've not done that bit. It's called the Sandover Highway, but it's not a highway. Right. It's just a sandy track. But there's a remote... The Sandover Highway. Yes. Literally, sand yes. over the highway. That's why it's called that. <laughs> um, but she wrote to me years ago and, and said, could you please come to our community. We've had a few suicides, and uh, but something has taken place. Uh, there's no church here, uh, but last Easter, the entire community got together and repented before God and to each other um, to get rid of the gambling and the grog. Yeah. And uh, Repenting meaning for those people who haven't got a religious background? You know, really humbly saying, sorry, I'm partly responsible sorry, for this. Taking responsibility, yeah. and that's the key word that we lack these days, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's really seeking blame easy. Seeking forgiveness. A lot of times yeah. we, we're very good at blaming, yes. as you said, but uh, to yeah. be able to say, you know what, I'm a part of this problem and, and I'm sorry for that yeah. and I want to make things right. Well, the whole community did this, probably wow. 150, 200 people. Wow. And... Um, and something really special took place. Uh, they built a little church that looks looks more like a um, a bus stop. It was just a little shelter, but they called it a church. And every week they started getting together and singing got old gospel songs and hymns, and and praying for one another. It was it really really special to see. Anyway, she wrote to me and said, "Could you come and um, tell us some Bible stories and 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 encourage us and." You could even bring your guitar and sing some songs. And I really love the way that she w was sending her request. She didn't really care that I was a, a singer. Yeah. She was more you could even. interested. Yes. Yes. And so we ended up going and spending a few days there. And I've been back probably half a dozen times since there. And it's been amazing to see the transformation take place mm. in that remote community. Um, I love that's what. That's what keeps me yeah. driven uh, yeah. to keep doing music around Australia. Yeah, because amongst the heart-wrenching stuff, there's that heartwarming stuff. Yes. What I'm on about here with Ordinary Angels is about opening my own mind and the mind of hopefully people out there who watch to different perspectives. Because we can get very locked into one perspective, can't we? And we go, well, that's the way we think. Uh, sometimes we're just not exposed to other things. Sometimes we block that out deliberately. Sometimes we're a bit lazy. We've, we've got the opportunity to. Yeah. But the more we open ourselves to different perspectives, the more we as humanity can understand each other. And this whole concept of forgiveness. I, I work with a lot of young women who have come from abusive situations. Very hard for them in their mid-20s in particular to reconcile their past, yes. which they, they want to block that out. And, and rightly so, with what's happening now when they're in complete and utter turmoil. And they haven't yet got that story of their future. 
And if we open our minds to understand where each of these people are in whatever situation it is, and the Aboriginal community has that horrific past, not just distant past, you know, when white man came and, and all of that, but also immediate past, because there's some still horrible stuff going on in those communities that hasn't been exposed to the wider community, um, to how they're feeling now and the changing of the generations and, and how IT is coming in and they're, they're getting lost in that, some people, to having a future that they can see open out before them and having courage. And I think what you're identifying there with forgiveness is that a lot of these people that I talk to don't realise that forgiveness is about us. It's not about letting the other person off the hook. It's not saying what they did was okay and, and I'm going to forget about that. It's going, that was, that was not good, but I don't want to continually be drawn back to that place. I want to cut that fishing line that's reeling me back there all the time. Yeah. So as a, as a Christian man and a person of faith, and, and obviously that's your impetus for everything that you do, um, but you have a, a wider perspective in that. Do you see, um, and this could be a curly question, right, because the, the Aboriginal tradition of the Dreamtime and their stories that they tell, from the Aboriginal people that I've talked to, sometimes that's got lost. It's got confused. White men came in and said, you can't look at that. You've got to talk about God in the language that we talk about that. Fortunately... We're now opening ourselves, aren't we, to more of that perspective and saying, what do you mean by that? What do those dream time stories have as part of your past, current and seeing into the future? What relevance do they have? And how does that connection back to the rich and wonderful culture that the Aboriginal people have? We can bring part of that forward. How do you see that playing I th out? Oh, I think the, um, the key is redeeming your past culture so that it does come into alignment. <clears throat> in many ways, our Indigenous brothers and sisters, and we've, we've got to always remember that <clears throat> before Captain Cook arrived in 1770, there was probably over 300 different tribal languages and nations mm. in Australia. Yeah, good word. And so it's, yeah. uh, it's not about just bundling everyone up and thinking that they all believe and think the same but the yeah. one thing i love and admire about uh, our aboriginal friends and brothers and sisters is uh, they all believe in the creator they believe that they have been created and that there is such value in life and for me it's it's simply a matter of bringing everything back into a a, a redeemed alignment with the creator and once we do that, uh, I, I believe things fall into perspective very, very easily. The Aboriginal people of Australia have felt for the last 200 years uh, quite dispossessed yes. and uh, abandoned and betrayed. And the amazing thing about the Bible, the Gospel, is that that's exactly what Jesus went through. And they identify so clearly and so closely with the abandonment that took place for him yeah. as a despised man who had never committed a sin and yet was hung on a Roman cross as a criminal. Mm. And Aboriginal people really identify with yeah. that. And, and the message of forgiveness that Jesus encouraged all of us to, uh, to step into all of gospel music is really about celebrating the yes. forgiveness that we've received. Yes. Uh, that we don't have to live with our past failures. Yes. Um, that, that we've been redeemed ourselves from that. And so uh, I, yeah, in some ways I think we've got so much to learn from uh, Aboriginal people right across Australia. Mm. Um, I, look, I can't wait to go bush again because it's uh, if I hang around the city too much, I just, <laughs> I just get confused and messed up. Yeah. And, um, get back out there and things seem so much clearer and simpler. Fantastic. Let's talk about your music. 22 albums. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we all know, and, and as musicians, we know it costs a lot of money to make an album. It takes a big chunk out of your life. You're 
are very uh, attached in some ways to that particular album project. For me, it's like looking back on a photo album of a, a certain part of my life because I've written songs or chosen songs that reflect who I am at that time, who David and I are, which is a compromise, a bit different to what you have to do. Um, so what's, what's your ongoing impetus to keep putting 22 albums in how many years did you say? 30 years of... 33 years 33 of, of yeah, full-time music. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Let's look, hope you're not like Jesus in that way. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> look, it's this um, the incredible joy and privilege of uh, of people still appreciating the songs that I sing. Uh, that people will still turn up to a concert. I'm sure Carter and Carter would say exactly the same thing. There's, Absolutely. It's just something about yeah. uh, we're so grateful that people still appreciate and connect uh, i had i had the honor uh, for the past two years of singing uh, at the capitol theater in tamworth with the uh, the, the the gospel show uh, yeah. with carter and carter and um i've got to say thank you because oh, you're most welcome. Um, both years the venue has just been packed out with people that can't wait to be there yeah. and, joyous isn't it and uh, from what i've heard uh, speaking to some of the staff at the capitol theater it's one of the most demanded and requested concerts during the uh, the Country Music Week in Tamworth. And yes. I'm thinking, that's fantastic. And and I feel so honoured that people um, still enjoy listening to, to my music. My son Ryan um, called me the other week when uh, we first put the Eternity CD out. Yes, and, uh, which is right here. It's this white that one. That one there, yep. yep. And, uh, Show that. We'll put up where we can um, source this from too. Thanks. Um, Ryan called me said, Dad, best album you've ever done. And I'm like, that's my son who doesn't listen to my kind of music very yeah. much. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's more of a metalhead. <laughs> but, he, on him. but he had to listen to the album and he just yeah. loved the message of, of uh, the songs that were in it. Um, and that album is really just a collection of songs about the hope of eternity yes. uh, that we live with. I thought, wow, that's, I take that as a high compliment from yes. one of my own boys. So, My daughter, a couple of years ago, we released a film clip to Dance in the Rain, and I'm doing a bit of a dance, right? My biggest compliment from her was, after a while, kind of a compliment, she goes, Mum, who choreographed you? <laughs> I said, no, my honey, I had to do it all on my own. She goes, wow, you've got better at dancing. Yeah. <laughs> I think when our kids critique us, <laughs> because they're embarrassed if we do something pretty clumsy. I know. And uh, so they're, yeah, they're wonderful, uh, wonderful people to speak into our lives. Yes. I, I as, a, as a dad of three sons, I so appreciate that I've got three mates yep. that have grown up and I've done my best to be a dad. But now I take so much advice from those three yes. young men yep. as they speak into my life. Yeah, me too, uh, particularly on fashion, because apparently I don't get that right. <laughs> and because I'm on camera and in concerts, I always have to run my outfits of special events by my children. Yeah. Yep. And uh, yesterday at the gospel concert, you'll know, as soon as I got off stage, I took my shoes off. I'm paying for that today, but apparently I needed to have a heel with that dress. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Is this the kind of advice your sons give you, or is it more like... I don't know what, because I've got daughters and granddaughters, women everywhere in my life. Yeah. How does that work for you? What kind of advice? Very different. <laughs> they don't tell you what high heels you should no, wear. No, I've never had too much critiquing with the fashion. Uh, <laughs> I had to borrow those high heels, by the way, and they're gone straight back. Yes. And I like yeah, them. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it terrible when you live in fear of your kids? <laughs> Apparently, yes. Well, we won't go into that because fashion's not a big thing. No, the boys are probably, they, they love speaking into. Uh, really, the the issues that um, I've got the privilege of being able to to talk about from stage, Dad. This is where people are at, and I really appreciate the advice. Yes. Um, from the boys. Me too. I have to say, from yeah, because they're living that life as yep. younger people, and we can get a little bit detached from that. I think back now and think of. Uh, I, I listen to some of the young people, and I think back when I was young, and I think mm, there was people our age going. <laughs> at the advice we were giving too. But I think that young people are actually are more courageous about a, a, a giving their advice and saying, you know, I've got something really worthwhile to contribute yep. here. But I also find that younger people in general are also willing to listen to some of the miles that we've done and go, yeah, this is how it was for me. And we, 
how how is it for you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, Fantastic. it's um, what a journey it's been, and yeah. uh, I, I love the fact that young people are interested. In, yep. um, I've, I've recorded quite a few songs and a few albums in recent years of, uh, of older songs, older hymns, uh, the Heritage Hymns, Volume 1 and 2. Right. Um, are songs from the, you know, the 1800s. Yes. And, uh, but reviving some of these old songs. That's what I'm into too. I love it. The great old words that we don't ever use anymore. Yes. You know, are in some of those songs. But I think we live in a generation that are looking for real integrity and truth mm. and uh, if, if our lives can reflect that yes. if our if our presentations and our music yep. can reflect that then young people will be attracted to it yes tell me about the big truck that you're hoping to purchase you've got a, a a fund me thing going on yeah tell us about that you've got a big vision of that people can see that on Steve's website stevegrace.com yeah um, tell me about that. It, it, it's an enormous undertaking. I know exactly from my perspective why you're doing it. It's to enhance what you're already doing. Um, it's a big vision. Tell us, how, what's, that, what's that about? How can people be involved? The Eternity Truck is, um, I, I turned 60 later this year and, I'm, and I was... Look at this face, you can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm thinking, what do I want to do? in my life between the ages of 60 and 70. And I love trucks, always have. I used to drive them. But I thought, wouldn't it be great to, to do a few more laps of Australia, yeah. um, but do outdoor events that, where the entire community can, can come together. And a lot of times, I don't know if you've experienced this, I'm sure you have, but a lot of times you go and do um, an event in a church and it's all a little bit, um, how do I put it? Churchy. It's just a bit churchy <laughs> and, and a little bit um, just done on a shoestring. That's yes. probably the best way to put it. Yes. And, and they're great, but you're talking a different... The presentation kind of, of it all. Yes. And I've, I, over the years, uh, as you have, you've always tried to, to present yourself and the message that you've got at the, the best... You possibly can at any point in time. Yes. And I thought... The message we've got is, is, is a message that saves the world yes. and we need to be proud of it and present yeah. it well. So my dream is to have a, uh, a semi-trailer, a truck stage, state of the art uh, with a uh, big screen, you know, daylight um, media, daylight you know, visuals, as well as um, you know, great uh, lighting and, uh, and sound and uh, to be able to take that to a lot of remote communities. In the last 10 years, I have done so many concerts in towns that have been devastated by drought, yes. by bushfire, by floods, and it's not getting any better. Yeah. Uh, the droughts are becoming more and more severe. And the one thing I do know is that when you roll into town and set up and put a concert on, put a big barbie on, People are going to get out of their houses and even if it's just to get everyone in that farming community together to have a big old whinge about how tough things are, yep. at least they're talking about life yes. and, and they're, um, they're relating to one another. Yes. Um, and they I, can see that even though it's bad for them, it's also bad for their neighbour. How can we help? Might not be the same bad. Yeah. A, a wife of a, a farmer up in central Queensland came up to me recently and she said, thank you so much for bringing your concert to our town. It's the first time in three years I've seen my husband laugh. Oh, wow. And it made me cry. But uh, the fact that uh, people are hurting right across our yeah. country. And uh, so my dream for the Eternity Truck stage is to be able to go out to these places, put on events that really help the local churches put on um, a, a you know, top quality event and uh, one where people feel that they are important. Yes. I've always thought if I can take my music out to people and tell them that they are important to God yep. where they live, you don't have to yes. go to some big event yes. in the big city to feel like you're, you're somebody. You are somebody right where you live. Absolutely. And that's probably yep. one of the prime messages that I've had over the last 30 yes. years. But um, on people can go to the website stevegrace.com to find out more about 
the Eternity Truck. Um, we're starting an official fundraiser for it. And amazingly, farmers and truckies all over the country are contacting me and saying, Steve, we want to be a part of this. I've got a feeling we're going to have a whole army of grey nomads with their four-wheel drives and caravans vol Trailing. volunteering to come along and help us. Fantastic. So that's my dream for yeah. 2020 to 2030 is Great. to be uh, doing laps of Australia with the Eternity Truck. Fantastic. It's slim, dusty, played in my hometown. music that Australian country sound that night slim dusty played in my hometown before we finish up there's a couple of things I need to clarify you know in showbiz we can kind of take on pseudonyms yes where, were you born a grace because it so suits everything that you do uh, my grandfather went back to southern Ireland and traced the Grace family history back to the 11th century. So yes, I am a Grace. So the, the name Grace goes back to the 11th century. It wasn't like Graceful or something else and got shortened over no, the years. No. Actual Grace. Uh, for 200 years, the Grace family migrated across to France and it became La Grosse. La Grosse. But then they all migrated oui, oui. back to Ireland and England. And right. uh, So yeah, um, I've... A lot of people ask me that. Yeah, of course. Is, is that a stage name? <laughs> yeah, of course. And I have to say... Especially given faith and gospel music and all yeah, of that, you yeah. know. But my mum and dad, um, when, on my birth certificate, I am a Stephen with a PH. So it's actually Stephen Grace, but I kind of think we'll Steve off Grace is pretty cool. I think that's fair. And I've, I've got to say, I, I've needed a, a lot of God's grace over the years. <laughs> I look back and realise, wow... Well, Lord, I don't always feel worthy to be doing your work. Yeah. But I'm very grateful. And, uh, and it, yeah, his grace is an amazing thing. Fantastic. So before we have a song, you get to ask me a question. Yep. Go for it. What would your advice be to... There's, a, there's thousands of young Aussies, young fellas and young girls that uh, would love to be a country singer one day. What would, uh, from all the experiences that you've had, what would be your best advice for them? I get asked this a lot, actually, because people want to know where to start. I think the very basic of any career in music is to find that thing about you that's unique. We have a lot of young people out there who are trying to copy Keith Urban or Casey Chambers because we feel that that will get us in the door. But really, the people who stand out, and whether they become big and famous or whether they just have an authentic, wonderful career like we've got, getting out there for how many decades and, and singing our songs, is to find that thing that is you, be passionate about what you do, get some skills. So don't just assume you're great at everything. You know, we're still learning songwriting and we're still learning to sing better and play better. Keep doing that. But then get a great team around you. Network, find the people that you can connect with that give you opportunities. Yeah. Um, if I hadn't had that opportunity of touring with you, and that's completely honest, you've always been held in my high regard because getting out there on the road gave me the courage to go, okay, I can connect with people. Find that connection, yeah. live it, be true to yourself. And uh, what will fall into place is what's meant to fall into place. For some of us, that's a career. For some of it's it's going, well, we have that as a little hobby and we love it, but we're meant to be living authentically somewhere else. Yep. I entered the Star Maker in Tamworth back did in you? 1984 and 85. And I, came, I did not know that. Got into the finals both ah. times and came second two years in a row. And who won that year? Those oh, that was years. Um, a girl called Fairly Arrow. Yes. And uh, the following year, a band called Great Divide. Right. And after that, I thought, man, Tamworth mustn't like me. So I gave up on it. And uh, I'm saying this is uh, like this is 33 years of uh, a full time music and career yeah. later to yeah. look back and realize, OK, it didn't work that way. Yeah. But it hasn't stopped me from giving it a go. Yeah. And uh, I started out singing in retirement villages back as a teenager. I realized that sometimes it's the little things that you do that will help to 
promote you along the way. Yes. Uh, don't go chasing after the fame. It'll come yeah. to you. Don't go if, chasing the rainbows. Yeah, if yeah. you're genuine with people. And, yeah, agreed. Uh, yeah. Agreed. And I think it's funny that in 1991 when we toured together, uh, both of us had kind of come from a country music background in some ways, but we weren't really doing country music. We were doing gospel that was a bit yep. broader, and now here we are. Yes. How many years later? Sitting on the country music couch. A lot. A lot. <laughs> a lot. Well, I would love it, and I'm sure my audience would love it, if you would sing a song for us. Thank you. Love to do that. And tell us a little about, a bit about this particular song. Oh, the song will tell the story pretty, okay. pretty well. Okay. It's, um, this is off a collection of songs I did as a tribute to, uh, to Slim Dusty. And um, it's called The Night Slim Dusty Played in My Hometown. some tickets to the Slim Dusty show. He was touring with his country band. The word had got around. That night Slim Dusty played in my hometown. I was raised on country music. Dad always followed Slim. I listened to his records and I dreamed to be like him. Country towns and concerts, a life of traveling round. That night, Slim Dusty played in my hometown. The night, Slim Dusty played in my hometown. I can still remember people came from miles around to hear that timeless music, that Australian sound that night slim dusty played in my hometown he humbly walked on stage in his old Akubra hat R.M. Williams boots slim dusty guitar strap and he played that old Martin, what a beautiful sound That night Slim Dusty played in my hometown There were farmers with their families Truckers, tradies, business suits Old folks by the busload Kids in hats and cowboy boots The atmosphere electric They sang every song out loud that night Slim Dusty played in my hometown The night Slim Dusty played in my hometown I can still remember people came from miles around To hear that timeless music, that Australian country sound That night Slim Dusty played in and his stories what a legendary life I always loved those moments when he sang songs with his wife Dad and me met Joy and Slim while the band were packing down that night Slim Dusty played in my hometown Australia's king of country loved to sing of who we are like our mate and some country music star he'll always be remembered I wish he was still around that night Slim Dusty played in my hometown the night Slim Dusty played in my hometown I can still remember people came from miles around 
music, that Australian country sound, that night slim dusty played in my hometown. Oh, that night slim dusty played in my hometown. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Uh, my ordinary angels, would you please thank again, I'm going to thank you from the bottom of my heart, Steve Grace, you are an ordinary angel. Mwah. Thank you and thanks so much for all that uh, you and Dave do around the country, encouraging and uh, bringing hope to people. It's awesome. Honoured to be a friend. When the mountain you're climbing seems never ending.